some people might say, oh, this is this is so so boring. Like only buying an ETF. I want like real parts of a company. I want to be an owner uh, of a part of a company. What would you uh, say to them? How would you counter this? Well, I would say that gain your interest from mountain biking and rock climbing. <laughs> <laughs> Willkommen zurück bei Finanzfitness. In diesem Video zeige ich euch ein Interview mit dem kanadischen ETF-Millionär Andrew Hallam. Er zeigt uns, wie er es geschafft hat, mit ca. 2800 Euro im Monat Millionär mit ETFs zu werden. Außerdem zeigt er uns, was er von Einzelaktien hält. Wir reden über Frugalismus und auch darüber, wie man wirklich Geld sparen kann. Zusätzlich sprechen wir darüber, wie man wirklich glücklich werden kann. Ich wünsche euch viel Spaß beim Video. Wenn ihr kein weiteres Video von Finanzfitness verpassen möchtet, dann abonniert doch den Kanal und klickt vielleicht auf die Glocke, dann verpasst ihr kein weiteres Video von mir. Viel Spaß, wir gehen direkt rein. I don't even know what to say. That's very yeah. cool. Yeah, I did that. Yeah, it's amazing that you do that. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say you do it. I'm like, yeah, awesome. I'll do it too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you're muscular. You're really muscular. That's cool. So you <laughs> you work out a lot. A lot. My always. My whole life. Yeah. It's it's interesting. I was just looking at some like uh, just some videos while I was waiting for you. I was yeah. looking at some YouTube videos on past Mr. Olympia winners who maintained their physique. Yeah. And some of them done a great job right into like their 70s. Well, see, like that's what you can do. Okay, yeah. um, Andrew. First of all, I you already know that I'm a big fan, and we have a lot in common. Um, um, probably a big difference in our portfolios at the moment, but um, I'm trying to get there. So um, let us know who you are writing this book and what's your story. Just very briefly for the beginning before I start uh, asking you some more questions. <laughs> Well, I was lucky because I met the right mentor at the right time. So I was really young. Um, I was 19 when I started to invest. And I was paying for my own college expenses. And I had a job at a, like a bus depot. And I worked the night shift. So like I fueled the buses and uh, checked the oil on them and recorded the mileage and drove them through an automated bus washer. And one of the mechanics at the bus depot Rumor had it, the other guys all talked about him in hushed whispers and said that he was a millionaire mm -hmm. and, and he was self-made. And one day, uh, and they said to me, look, if this guy ever talks to you about money, make sure you listen to him. And one day he took me into his office and he asked me a question. Uh, he asked me, what would you do if I gave you $10,000 right now? And I thought, oh, oh my God, he's going to give me money. <laughs> He's actually going to give me money. This is bizarre, the, the millionaire mechanic. Uh, and, and I thought about it. And I figured, hmm, well, I, I guess I'd put it towards my education. And he told me then that if I had said that I was going to buy like a, a new stereo for my car uh, yeah. or if I buy like a new bike, he told me that he probably wouldn't talk to me again unless he had to. So he was an unusual guy, yeah. but he said, but he, you know, he inspired in me. He said, look, you can build financial independence at, at a relatively young age and you don't need a really huge salary to do it. All you need is financial literacy and almost nobody teaches this in school. He says, you'll learn like mathematical concepts in middle school and high school that are incredibly complex, yet financial literacy is so so mm -hmm. simple and you won't learn it in school so if you actually take just a little bit of time to learn something that is easier and simpler than what the typical 15 year old kid learns in a mathematics class yeah. you learn these concepts you can be financially independent at a young age so he got me investing from the point when i was 19 and i realized too as i grew older Uh, I was investing more and more money as my salary increased. And I recognized that very few people knew anything about investing. Mm -hmm. And if they, if they did invest at all, they would walk into a bank and they would ask the banks to invest the money for them. Mm -hmm. And so you had two problems. One, you had people not initiating, not deciding that, hey, If I put a little bit of money away today, just a small amount regularly, 
this can grow to really large amounts over time. So that was problem number one. Mm -hmm. Problem number two is that even if people recognize that fact, they would walk into the local bank, ask them to invest money for them, and as a result of that, they would get absolutely fleeced by the financial service industry because they would pay really high fees for those products. So I wrote a book called Millionaire Expat, and mm -hmm. I said, hey, there are these really, really bad products. Not just bad, like if you go to a Canadian bank, they're pretty bad. If you go to a U.S. bank and just ask them to do it for you, just they're pretty bad. But overseas, like when I was looking at what was being sold in the Middle East, what was being sold in Asia, what was being sold in Africa, they were horrific products that have virtually no chance of beating inflation. And I never imagined, I never imagined, Mike, in my wildest dreams that those the exact same products that are sold to Germans when they go into the German banks. I had no idea. So just this small letter, level of financial literacy on these two levels, one, get started and get going, even with a small amount. And whatever you do, do not walk into a German bank and ask them to invest your money. <laughs> <laughs> um, your book says the nine rules of wealth should have learned in school. And uh, why don't you walk us through these nine rules just a little bit? I mean, you, you've started already um, by explaining about the costs and about these horrific products um, that some banks offer, obviously. But... Why don't you walk us uh, through these rules a little bit because um, maybe not everyone knows it and maybe even or especially for especially for younger people. Um, what are the main things they should know um, that you can get from your book? And obviously um, they can probably uh, buy the book and I'll link it in the description below. So if someone sees it, they can buy the book and um, um, read it in more detail. So why don't you walk us through these uh steps just a little bit or some of the steps maybe i think the the most important one is the recognition that you don't need a really high salary to build wealth mm -hmm. number one mm -hmm. number two most of the people you know and i'm going to say this and i'm going to say it really directly because i have all kinds of evidence to suggest this most of the people that you know with really really high salaries do not have high wealth Mm -hmm. And that might that might fly in the face of everything you believe. You might see that they they keep buying the latest BMW every second year. Mm -hmm. You might see that they own a really nice home. It's a really big, well furnished place. You might see on like Facebook that they that they're always traveling on their Instagram account. Your pictures from them traveling on these five star vacations. Mm -hmm. From what I've learned about wealthy people. Most high-salaried people are not actually rich. Mm -hmm. So if you spend all that you make, you're not rich mm -hmm. because the moment that salary dries up, if it dries up at all, then you're left with nothing. So mm -hmm. a wealthy person is someone who doesn't need to work mm -hmm. ever for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Not only do they not need to work, but they could choose not to work but still live on an amount of money that is twice the median income of typical German family. Mm -hmm. So they, are, they earn two times, they can spend two times what the typical German family earns mm -hmm. with no working. So that's a measurement of, of true wealth. Mm -hmm. the, the recognition that, too, something that I didn't talk about in Millionaire Teacher, but it's really very, very apparent when it comes down to behavior and happiness studies. Somebody might be listening to this right now and they might say, But, but I, I feel so good about driving that brand new Mercedes Benz. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that I always have the latest car. The fascinating part about this is what, what happens to us behaviorally is it's called hedonic adaptation. Mm -hmm. It's a psychological process. So you buy a brand new Mercedes Benz. And for the first couple of months, it's really exciting for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After that... It's just another car that yes. gets you from day to day. So there have been two studies done on this. One was Michigan State University, and the study was actually replicated by a German university as well, where they asked people all kinds of questions uh -huh. about how they felt uh, based on different scenarios that would happen yeah. to them during the day. Yeah. They, didn't tell, they didn't tell them that the, the, the prime variable they were looking for, which was, 
does driving high status vehicles actually make you happier? Mm -hmm. So what they ended up finding, of course, was that people that drove like secondhand Honda Civics or Toyotas mm -hmm. enjoyed their day-to-day -day driving experience as much as the people that drove the brand new Mercedes, the brand new Teslas, the brand mm -hmm. new BMWs. Mm -hmm. And it had to do with that hedonic adaptability. So once you get that out of the way and you understand how our brains work, I mean, we're incredibly primitive as a mm -hmm. species. Mm -hmm. We know intuitively, people listening to me might go right now, go, hmm, actually, maybe this crazy bald guy <laughs> makes some sense because the people that have the biggest houses and the people that have the nicest cars, if the money or the things allow them to be happier, wouldn't they be laughing more? Wouldn't yeah. they be smiling more? Yeah. Wouldn't they be the people that we look at as they just, they, they've got that great level of inner contentment, but it's not true at all. So the stuff that we own does not precipitate any yeah. kind of actual happiness. Once we get that aside, Mm -hmm. Okay, now this is where it gets really cool, because once you have that aside and you don't fall victim to chasing what you think is a cultural norm, mm -hmm. instead, now you can put money away in investments, which can end up enhancing your life because it gives you all kinds of opportunities to enjoy experiences. Mm -hmm. And experiences and time spent with people we love have direct connection to happiness based mm -hmm. on behavioral psychological studies. I, I, I totally agree with that. I actually, I would actually say I am an example of the fact that it doesn't make me happy because I actually bought a, um, an Audi. I bought an Audi. It was a used car though, but it was only one year old. It's a German car. A lot of Germans drive big cars. And after, I, I'd say three months, I was like, I don't need the car. Like it's too mm -hmm. big. It's too big for me. It's very new. I, I love the, the features it has, but I was actually happier with my old uh, golf convertible um, that <laughs> someone broke in um, when I was studying. So um, like, do I really need the car? And then I went to the to the shop and, and I tried to give it back because I'm, I'm financing it. And then they want wanted more money for me to give it back. And I was like, oh, my God, no. Like, I have to pay to give it back. And now, like, I'm even, like, they're getting more money from me. And now I'm, I put my head to it that I'm actually doing exactly what you're saying and buying a used car that is not so expensive and I'm giving back that car um, as soon as possible. That's so interesting, isn't it? You, you know, when you actually ask somebody who has a really expensive car, whether they're happy or driving it. If you make it a question that's that direct, mm -hmm. they'll say, of course. Of course, yeah. Of course I'm happy or driving it. This is based on what behavioral psychologists call reflective happiness. Mm -hmm. But it, it's not real happiness. True happiness is experiential happiness. And when we isolate that com those two components, mm -hmm. we actually recognize that the thrill of the driving experience wears off and eventually... No matter yeah. what you buy, whether it's the latest iPhone or the latest car, yes. it just becomes another tool to get through yeah. day by day. So exactly. it's really, I think it's really cool to recognize that if we don't fall for that cultural norm, mm -hmm. we can be just as happy. No, we can be happier yeah. because when we build wealth, we now have this wonderful choice. Where if you choose, for example, because you've learned this at a young age, mm -hmm. so you're 31 now. Mm -hmm. If you choose to take a year off at age 38, you're going to have the financial resources to do that. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of living for today means enjoying the experiences. Mm -hmm. Don't work too hard. Don't sacrifice the people in your life mm -hmm. because they're far more important than mm -hmm. the job and then and the material acquisitions, the some the things that people buy. Yeah. But money can buy you time. Mm -hmm. And time, if it's spent if it's spent well, it buys happiness. So if time is spent with people you love and respect, having new novel experiences, to me this is key. This is what this is the purpose of investing and building wealth. Mm -hmm. How do they get from there from not spending so much and then 
Um, what's the next point? What should they do? I would say set a goal in terms of how much you can save each month. Mm -hmm. So at the very beginning of the year, one thing my wife and I always did was we determined how much we would save that year. Mm -hmm. And it was our goal. And we would write it down on a piece of paper so we could always see it. And we'd post it somewhere in the house. Mm -hmm. And then as with any goals, you share it with somebody, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's a physical goal, you want to run a marathon, you want to be able to do 50 push-ups, mm -hmm. you want to be able to bench yeah. press your weight, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah, you have a plan. You have, you have to have a plan and you share the goal with someone. So there's a level of accountability. And then work towards that goal and you see the achievement. So we would write down on that paper how much we had saved each month and we work towards hitting that goal. And when we achieve that goal, um, well, I guess every month, anything else was like extra. It was a bonus. Mm -hmm. So you know, we would always take the money out first, though. So if we get paid, the first thing we do, the first thing we do is we remove the money at the beginning of the month. So that money gets invested. So there's no temptation to spend it because we don't have it to spend. Yeah. Yeah. We've invested the money mm -hmm. and live on whatever is left. So, and then they start investing the money and uh, what should they invest in and how should they invest? That's, uh, that would be the next point. Yeah, that's an excellent question. The reason we don't want to go into the banks is because the banks make money from you. Mm -hmm. They, their prime directive, their main priority is to make money for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so what you want to do is you want to ensure that you have maximum safety through diversification. Mm -hmm. So through diversification, you would own a sliver of virtually, think of it as a sliver of every stock in the entire world. Mm -hmm. If you think about that way, it works quite well. Yeah. You can actually buy a product that gives you a small share exposure into virtually every share every U.S. share, German share, Australian share, mm -hmm. at least a very, very broad sampling of what each country has to offer. Mm -hmm. And you, within this product, there's nobody actively trading the shares within it. Mm -hmm. So you own all of these shares all of the time, and no one is trying to look for opportunities for you. You are not trying to say, well, I'm going to buy Apple this month and I'm going to buy Netflix, and then I'm going to buy Volkswagen. Like, mm -hmm. nobody is trading the shares within it, so mm -hmm. you can buy a global stock market index, mm -hmm. and in doing so, you have exposure to the world's stock markets. Mm -hmm. And over long periods of time, 30 years plus, historically, it's earned average returns between 7 to 11% per year, mm -hmm. over 30-year periods. Over short time periods, it can go down, it can go up, but we're really looking long term. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's even 55 years old has a 30 year duration. Mm -hmm. Because it's not how long you're going to be working accounts, it's how long you're going to be living. Mm -hmm. So as you're young, you're adding money to your investments. When you retire, you're taking money out of your investments but you're not pulling the whole thing out on the day you retire mm -hmm. because you need to continue to grow so that you can pull a sustainable amount from your portfolio every month or every year mm -hmm. to meet your expense needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a 30 year old has like at least a 55 year investment duration mm -hmm. statistic if they live to their 85 mm -hmm. and it can be so simple. It can really be this simple. It could be a global stock index mm -hmm. and a global bond index. Mm -hmm. It could really be that simple. Bonds, they don't pay very high interest, mm -hmm. but they provide stability for the investment portfolio. And once a year, just make sure that your total value is still 70% stocks, 30% bonds. So mm -hmm. in some cases, you'll need to rebalance it. Mm -hmm. So let's say stocks have risen a lot. Mm -hmm. You need to sell a little bit of stocks, add to the bonds, and bring it back to that original 30 or 70 30 allocation. Mm -hmm. You could do this literally for the rest of your life. It yeah. increases stability which re and it reduces uh, short term risk. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, you could do that with ETFs, right? 
for example, because in Germany we have ETFs. We don't have like we don't really have index funds. I have the feeling I've never really seen it, but we have ETFs, right? Same thing. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Yeah, it's just exactly. purchased differently. So an ETF is an index fund mm -hmm. that you purchase off the stock exchange. Yeah. And so, for example, a person who says I'm 20. Um, I don't need bonds uh, because I'm in, I, I'll be investing for at least 40, 60, I don't know, 50, 60 years. Um, and I'll start buying uh, bonds when I'm 30 or when I'm 40. Would that be okay? For some, but for most, most people think that they have an emotional strength that they don't have mm -hmm. <laughs> when it comes to investing. <laughs> I get it. So, if you're 22 years old, and most 22-year-olds would actually think like this. They would yeah. say, hey, stocks beat bonds over long time periods. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go 100% stocks. Mm -hmm. If the stock market drops 45% in a given year, which mm -hmm. is absolutely possible, it's mm -hmm. happened many times, mm -hmm. that investment portfolio will drop 45%. Now, that in itself is really hard emotionally to take. Mm -hmm. But what makes it worse is when the market falls 45%, if you go online and you start reading market news, market predictions, you turn on the radio, you hear some quote expert mm -hmm. telling you it's going to only be worse. It's going mm -hmm. to get worse. And there'll be people telling you what they're doing now. right now, right? What they're doing yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah. The people telling you sell now. There's yeah. always going to be somebody telling you that and pushing your emotional buttons. If, on the other hand, you have something that's more balanced, mm -hmm. like maybe 80% stocks, 20% bonds, mm -hmm. if the market falls 45%, mm -hmm. you'll probably only fall about 30%. Mm -hmm. And so this can help you maintain that, what I call, an emotional equanimity. Mm -hmm. So, so much of this is about human emotions. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. they play a huge role in this. So, although there are young people who could handle 100% stock allocation, there are also young people who have never smoked a day in their life, mm -hmm. only eat organic foods, exercise five times a week, and don't drink alcohol. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are those people. But are you one of them? Is that the question? That's what I have to ask myself, right? Yes, yes. And this, this, this falls in line with how much discipline have you exhibited in the past mm -hmm. in your life? Mm -hmm. And if, if you have rock-hard body, <laughs> and you, you, know, you're, you meditate every day, you have the the power to sit and do 20 minutes of meditation every day. We know, we know. Evidence says that our lives would be better if we meditated every day. Yeah. 20 minutes. But do we if do it? Yeah. If you're the Zen ninja, yeah. <laughs> you're like Star Wars Yoda and Luke Skywalker combined. Yeah. And then you tell me, I can handle market volatility of 100% stocks. I'll say... Yeah, you might be right. Most people can't, but you you might be right. <laughs> okay, that's really, really interesting. Um, okay, so let's say in Germany, um, then people would, wouldn't go to a bank that's in their, um, in their town, but they, for example, um, I speak uh, from experience here, they would go to an online bank. We call it the on an online bank. And there you have very low costs. You can invest uh, through um, dollar cost averaging, like 100 euro in, or, or 200. How, how, that's how they could start. So they invest into a global ETF. But so what should the bonds, the bonds part look like? Should that be a bond world ETF? Or because German bonds are like, they have been for at zero point. Uh, uh, five minus zero point five for a very long time. So um, a lot of people are saying that you should just put your money into an account at the moment, and once it gets goes up a little bit more, and then you should maybe buy one of these bonds. So or should I just take a a an ETF that is focusing on bonds in Europe or all over the world? What should I do here? 
it's pretty simple to go with a global bond market ETF. Mm -hmm. But I want to back up a little bit. It has not been a really long time that Germany has had low bond interest. It's mm -hmm. been a really short time. Yeah. And we often think of five years or two years or even 10 years as a long time. No, blip. That's nothing, right? It's mm -hmm. a blip. What a bond index does, and here's the difference, a bond ETF. Mm -hmm. So a German bond ETF perpetually ends up creating different, uh, has a rotational process of bond ETFs. Mm -hmm. So when the, when, the, when the yield drops, the price rises. If you're continuing to buy, I would feel very comfortable buying a full German bond ETF. Mm -hmm. Almost no one in Germany would, but I understand how this works, right? Mm -hmm. I would be, wow, yeah, okay. When my one-year bond ETF expired, it would buy another German one-year bond. When the two-year expired, it would buy another two-year bond. When a three-year expired, it would buy another three-year bond. And the prices that you're buying are going to be reflected by that low interest rate. So you're going to be paying lower prices for these things. And it rotates. So a bond is one thing. Yes, a bond can be risky because it can lose to inflation and the interest rate can be low. Mm -hmm. But a bond ETF, that deals with shorter term or broad term maturity dates, it rotates on itself. So it's perpetually picking up new ones along the way. That's a completely different animal. So when you hear people talk about don't invest in bonds, they're not talking about a bond ETF. Mm -hmm. Having said that, just getting that part out of the way, why not go with a global bond ETF just because it does add further global diversification. Mm -hmm. So it gives you exposure to other bond, government bonds in Europe, in Canada, in Australia, in uh, the mm -hmm. UK, in the United States. Just mm -hmm. gives you a combination of everything, which of course then just broadens the diversification, which long term mm -hmm. reduces, reduces the risk. Mm -hmm. Some people might say, "Oh, this is this is so so boring. Like only buying an ETF. I want like real parts of a company. I want to be an owner uh, of a part of a company." What would you uh, say to them? How would you counter this in in some way? What could they do to make it more interesting? Well, I would say that gain your interest from mountain biking and rock climbing. <laughs> <laughs> Don't gain your don't, if, you're, if you're gaining excitement from your investments, there's something wrong, right? Good investing is not supposed to be exciting. It's about as exciting as watching paint dry. So if you're looking for excitement in your life, the last thing you want to do is buy an individual company share because you want added excitement. Go skydiving. Go bungee jumping. Go, go and do something that will actually give you real excitement because long term, if you're out buying individual shares... You're competing against the professionals who are also doing so, and most of them, statistically speaking, more than 90% of them will underperform that portfolio of global ETFs. Mm -hmm. So you might buy some individual shares and get lucky for a short time, maybe mm -hmm. a year, maybe five, maybe six. That's a bullet. That's a super, super short time period. That's not even a time period that anyone with any common sense should really be talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So statistically speaking, you're far better off going with a portfolio of ETFs and leave the excitement to the things that really give excitement and don't and won't statistically detract from your long-term wealth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you ask yourself, you look at actual probabilities. And so the probability is that a globally diversified index fund over our lifetime will outperform over a lifetime when we choose to buy with individual shares. Mm -hmm. So it's all about probability. So let's say I'm 30 years old at the moment, and, or 31, I'm 31 years old, but let's say there's a 30-year-old person, and should this 30-year-old person then have 70% in a global ETF and then 30% in an ET, uh, ETF that's focusing on bonds or just has bonds in there, um, how should they um, allocate the portfolio by uh, like once they get older, a little bit older, right? Mm -hmm. and most people will increase the bond allocation as they age. But if you want to live a long time, and you want your money to last a long time, I wouldn't suggest going any more than 40 to 45% in mm -hmm. bonds ever. Mm -hmm. So make sure that the majority is going to be stocks 
and then the smaller component would be bonds. Mm-hmm. So for me, for example, I think right now we're I have something like thirty six percent, thirty six to forty percent bonds somewhere mm-hmm. in there, and it stays roughly in that range. Even when I'm eighty years old, I'll never have more than forty percent bonds. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. Um, another part um, that I I feel like also played a huge role in what how and why you became a millionaire uh, or the millionaire teacher is I I have the feeling that it is that you lived uh, really frugally for a very long time. I found out that um, not spending so much on materialistic things um, actually makes you happier. And it's not only the car where you can save costs, but it's a lot of a lot of money you can save there. But how was this, uh, uh, the situation of living more frugally or really frugal, how was that for you? And was it also tough for you? And why don't you uh, um, help us out there a little bit with that? Well, for me, it was fun. And I was only frugal, like, in my, probably in my 20s, and then gradually started working my way out of that. My friends, though, some of my friends still call me frugal. And I don't think so, because I will buy whatever it is I want to buy. It's just my needs are not what a lot of other people's needs are. So Mm -hmm. maybe the frugality became something that was hardwired inside me. But for me, I, I didn't find it as, I found it as more of a fun challenge than anything else. So it was, it's like, you know, why would you run a marathon? That's so hard, all the training, but the process is fun. And why would you do that football tournament? Because you have to train with your football team. You go through that process with your football team. And, and the games are hard because it's intense. But there's a fun part of all of this because there's that achievement that's associated with it. And the frugality felt just like that. So for me to say, or someone to say to me, oh, you didn't have fun when you were in your 20s. It's just like someone telling a football player, oh, you don't have fun because you, you have to play football. And it looks hard. Well, hey, it looks hard, but actually going through the process and doing it is actually pretty challenging. So the, mm-hmm. fru- the frugality part, especially early on, it was fun because it was a challenge. And because now that I know, even though I was frugal, why was I happier than just about everybody else I knew? <laughs> well, I wasn't chasing things. I wasn't chasing material things. So when we chase material things, we get disappointed because we realize that when we buy that latest phone, it's like just eating sugar. It's a sugar fix. Mm. It makes us happy for a moment. And then there's a crash and we want the next thing. So because I never fell for that, I was, I was in a happier zone. Overall, my level of contentment was here. Whereas a lot of other people might have been down, up, down, up, down, up, mm-hmm, down. Mm-hmm. But I had more of a stable level of contentment because, and of course, this is what I learned later, looking at behavioral research on, um, on things that we buy, material acquisitions, and how it's really the experiences, mm-hmm. the time spent with people we love, that make us, uh, that make us happy. It's not stuff. Mm-hmm. So, I, so I didn't have to give anything up and now I recognize that it's kind of cool like reading the behavioral studies now and I'm like mm-hmm. now I can see I can, I, now I get why I was happy even when I was like crazy frugal and I was I was crazy frugal <laughs> and this is the last thing I want to get into because also my, my, I asked my students so is there something I can ask him that you really want to know and obviously um, some of them said so how much did he earn a month to get to the point where he is right now and how much did he um, spend uh, or invest every month? In terms of starting out, I started out with, and this is how it was, it was sort of, this is how it inspired me when that mechanic said to me, $100 a month, you can do 100 a month. And I said, I can't do 100 a month. That's too much. Yeah. And then he said, wait, wait, I've watched you buy like a Coca-Cola and like chocolate from that vending machine over there. Every night you go there and you buy something. Mm-hmm. He says, if you do the math on this and you spend something like $3 and 30 cents a day, there's a hundred a month. And I went, Oh, $3 and 33 cents a day. That's what I need to save. And he showed me how, if I did $3 and 33 cents a day, he showed me how at age 65, it is possible for me to have a million dollars on three dollars 
and 33 cents a day. Mm -hmm. And when he showed me that, I thought, wow. So then when I started to earn more money, I started to invest more money just to accelerate that whole process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you didn't earn more just from your salary as a teacher. How high was the salary that you had um, being a teacher and um you didn't earn I, I I heard that you didn't earn more than I was it five thousand a month? I'm I'm not I don't I don't I can't re recall. Yeah, so when I started out I was earning um two thousand eight hundred a month. So about two thousand and twenty yeah, so and that was over a ten month period. So I just earned twenty eight thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Um and that was a long time ago too. So this would have been like mid 1990s, 1996, mm -hmm. or earlier than that. Um, so, yeah, that was it was worth more then than it is now. But um, yeah, my income as a school teacher was was never exceptionally high. Mm -hmm. So when I I got lucky when I started teaching at a private school in Singapore, and the pay was much higher. But of course, you're not contributing to any kind of pension. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. You have that as a, a counter factor. So, but yeah, no, there's never a lot. It was never a crazy amount of money that I earned. Mm -hmm. You don't need to earn a really big income. You don't need to sell yourself or sell your soul for a job you might not like just because it pays more. So, what I the advice I pass to people is do a job that you're going to like. Don't do a job because you think it's going to pay you a lot of money mm -hmm. because your employer buys your life. They purchase pieces of your life. And you can't put a price on that. Mm -hmm. Time is the only non-renewable resource that you have. So enjoy your job while you do it. Don't prostitute yourself for a job. Mm -hmm. Just this, because of me. Yeah. And this is, this is exactly why I became a teacher. Because I started out um, becoming an engineer. And I found out that I didn't like it. And I only did it because I thought I would make a lot of money being an engineer. Yeah. And then I found out that it doesn't make me happy. It yeah. Didn't make me happy. And this is like now I love my job at the moment. I'm really happy with what I'm doing and I'm trying to to share uh, what you keep telling me. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Basically, to sum this up, um, what you're saying is everyone, no matter how high the income is, should or can invest and make a fortune out of this and be um, really wealthy. But someone should actually do something that they love right and i think too no matter how old you are mm -hmm. you may not grow wealthy but you'll grow wealthier mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's the key that's can the key. i be better off in the future yes if you yes. follow this pattern yes will you become a millionaire maybe maybe not but that's not the point that really yeah. matters yeah. if you have lots of time absolutely if you're young mm -hmm. you're in your 20s your 30s absolutely the odds are, yeah, very, very high that you'll become a millionaire. But if you're starting when you're in your 40s and 50s, the odds are lower. But that does not mean you shouldn't do it because mm -hmm. it will still make you wealthier mm -hmm. than you ordinarily would be. So there's ne it's never too late to start. Amazing. Thank you so much. I, I really want to um, thank you for, for taking the time. I think it's absolutely amazing. The book was kind of like... Um, a, a, well, like a mentor for me because I found out that um, I really needed someone to, to guide me through this whole thing and I feel like books can really help you. So everyone um, who wants to find out more about Andrew um, and about his way, about how he invested and how you should invest, um, this is the book you can buy. I, I'm going to link it down below. And I wish you a great day and a great week. Thank you very much, Andrew, and I hope we're going to talk again. Sounds good, Mike. Thank you so much. Take Thank care. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ich hoffe, das Video mit Andrew Hallam hat euch gefallen und ihr konntet genauso viel daraus mitnehmen wie ich. Ich fand es super hilfreich, super interessant und wenn ihr keine weiteren Videos von mir von Finanzfitness verpassen möchtet, dann klickt doch auf Abonnieren. Vielleicht klickt ihr sogar auf die Glocke, dann bekommt ihr jedes Mal eine Nachricht, wenn ein neues Video hochgeladen wird. Vielleicht liked ihr sogar dieses Video, wenn es euch gefallen hat oder schreibt einen Kommentar, wenn ihr gerne eine Anregung geben wollt. Ich wünsche euch noch einen schönen Tag. Macht's gut. Ciao.